Hi everyone, I'm Jeremy Dickinson. I thank you all for watching. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Philosophy Clips. In this Philosophy Clip, I will continue my discussion of Don Marquis's classic 1989 essay, Why Abortion is Immoral. So this is part two and the concluding part of my discussion of Marquis's essay. In part one, I did the stage setting. I set up how Marquis is developing in his 89 paper um, a moderate secular restrictivism or a moderate secular pro-life position. So he thinks that abortion is, for the most part, Im morally impermissible. Um, he sets aside the legal stuff to focus on the moral stuff in his paper. And I talked about how his position is secular because it doesn't rely a single bit on any religious premise whatsoever. And in fact, Marquis takes great pains to distance himself from those who would arrive at their restrictivist positions by appealing to things like the sacredness of human beings or other religious notions. So sometimes the theories that develop uh, pro-life arguments are called sanctity of human life theories, and Marquis is definitely not numbered among the sanctity of human life theorists. So we also talked about how Marquis, he thinks that the key way for understanding or solving, as it were, the abortion debate is by thinking about what, what makes it wrong to kill someone? What makes it wrong to kill you and I? And then by answering that question, we can ask whether or not that theory, whatever we arrive at theoretically, applies to fetuses. And we saw that the theory he arrives at, the theory that he thinks is the correct one, the one that sufficiently explains across a wide range of cases why it's wrong to kill me if I'm killed, um, is the fact that I'd be deprived of a valuable future. He takes this to be a very general view, and it provides us with a sufficient condition for the rawness of killing, so I'm wrongfully killed if I'm deprived of a valuable future when I am killed. And moreover, this applies generally, um, and, as it were, he thinks it applies to fetuses. And so he just basically, in order to arrive at his um, pro-life position, his restrictivist position, he ends up just applying DTWK, the deprivation theory, the wrongness of killing, to fetuses. We know it applies to us, he thinks, but it also applies to fetuses. So let's see if we can understand why is that Marquis thinks that we should subscribe to DTWK in the first place. So he does think it's very intuitive. So DTWK is a very intuitive principle, but he doesn't want to just rest on the fact that it's an intuitive principle. It's not, it's not, it's not just that it's the maybe the common um, theory that we would have in mind when we explain why it is that it's wrong to kill somebody. So this does seem to be a very natural um, and intuitive view. But again, he wants to provide support for it. So how are we thinking about deprivation? Maybe we should say a few things about the principle. We're, we're supposed to think about deprivation as you know being prevented from um, having the goods of life that we would have had were we not to have you know been killed. And so in order to work out an account of deprivation, you have to be thinking about a theory of well-being, a theory of those things that make our lives go good for us. What kinds of things are intrinsically good for us? And so in order to work out a, com a complete um, understanding of DTWK, you'd have to have a, a theory of well-being worked out. Marquis in his paper, he's really just doing the heavy-duty philosophical lifting and can just say whatever the, tr whatever the correct view of well-being is, he can subscribe to. Killing someone's a supposedly, presumably, is going to deprive them of those good things that they would have had were they not to have been killed. And so deprivation, that's how we should be thinking about it, is we're going to be prevented from um, those things that would make our lives go good for us were we not to have been killed. Now keep in mind that the preventions here, um, they, they amount to deprivations, and deprivations are a kind of prevention that we'd want to say all things being equal leads to wrongness. Okay, So you might think that there's that there are some kinds of preventions that don't amount to wrongness. So if I prevent you from enjoying um, a cupcake, right, that I was given, it was given exclusively to me, I would deprive you of the cupcake. I would deprive you of enjoying a cupcake because it was given to me only, okay? So not all preventions amount to deprivations. Deprivations are um, all things being equal, things that um, are wrong. They're wrongful preventions, if we put it that way. But not all preventions are like that as exemplified in the example just given of the cupcake. So that's how we're to understand uh, deprivation. 
Um, uh, keep in mind that uh, one um, really, really positive aspect of the view just out of the gate is that DTWK, it nicely explains why it is that the primary victim of a killing is a person who's killed as opposed to the murderer or as opposed to the loved ones of the person who's killed. We've seen other theories in part one that say that. So DTWK has that going for it. It also provides um, us with a natural property to account for the wrongness of killing. So there are other views that account for the wrongness of killing that appeal to supernatural properties like the property being sacred. So what makes it wrong to kill someone according to the sanctity of human life theorists is that human beings have the property of being sacred when someone is killed on, on their view like that sacredness is being violated. But that requires belief in something religious or supernatural. Mar on Marcos's view, he says, you could be an atheist and accept my view of the wrongness of killing because the property that he's providing is purely natural. Okay, it doesn't rely on anything religious or supernatural. So it's the property of being deprived of a valuable future. That's a natural property on his view. So a natural property as opposed to a supernatural one. And that's supposed to be a benefit to the view. Also, the view is in species chauvinistic. So DTWK is a principle that could, or a theory that could account for the wrongness of killing our non-human animal cousins and friends. Right, so if think about the great apes, for example, some of the higher mammals, we think that, gosh, they it seems like killing them would deprive them of valuable futures. So it'd be wrong to kill them as well. Of course, perhaps DTWK is going to extend and apply very widely in the animal kingdom. Marquis doesn't take a stand on that, so I'll just set that issue aside. But it could apply, broadly speaking, um, to many, many animals. But it could also apply to beings that are like us in terms of, you know, um, um, having advanced levels of rationality and the like that give us good lives uh, on balance. Um, but being, but those beings supposedly don't have, you know, they're not, um, they don't have our biological forms there. They have a different biology. They're not members of the species Homo sapiens. So they're, they're different, you know, different physical kinds, different biological kinds that could be like us in terms of rational and and capable of enjoying their lives um, to a great deal, such that it would be wrong to kill them because you'd be depriving them of, of a valuable future. So here, just be keeping in mind like, that what Mark is doing, he's like covering his bases. Like suppose, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, ends up, um, um, dis um, ends up discovering that there are beings like us, but they're not human beings. Um, all things being equal, DTWK would predict that it's wrong to kill them, generally speaking. Okay, So it's not species chauvinistic in a couple of different ways, as you've seen. Moreover, DTWK is consistent with the permissibility of active euthanasia. So this is an important point because uh, Marquis does think that active euthanasia is morally permissible, um, but those who would run pro-life arguments or restrictivist arguments, um, again, on, from the sanctity of human life perspective, they tend to think that it is impermissible to perform active euthanasia on medical patients. So I need to say a couple things to make this make some sense here. So there's a difference in the euthanasia literature between active euthanasia and passive euthanasia. And, and in current times, um, passive euthanasia is morally acceptable in a range of cases so long as certain important conditions have been satisfied, as you can imagine. But active euthanasia is frowned upon. And now, don't please don't confuse active euthanasia with um, physician-assisted suicides. I think sometimes um, we, um, we conflate the two um, concepts, but there's, at least in some circles, in many circles, there's a distinction between active euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, and the difference involves who's administering the, um, the death, who's administering the killing. Is it oneself? In that case, that's suicide, even if you are being assisted by a physician. When it comes to active euthanasia, it's the medical professional who's administering the killing. At least that's how we incar things up in this video. Um, we don't need to get into a terminological debate here. So the active... Um, uh, so in the medical field, active euthanasia is currently considered to be impermissible. Passive euthanasia is considered to be permissible. And those who run sanctity of human life theories, they tend to think that there's a key difference between killing on the one hand and letting die on the other. Letting die can be permissible across a range of cases, but killing 
generally speaking, is frowned upon and considered impermissible. Well, someone like Marquis thinks that um, active euthanasia is permissible, should be permissible, um, and for the same reasons that we think passive euthanasia is permissible. So we tend to think that passive euthanasia is, is permissible because of mercy considerations, or putting someone out of his or her misery, um, but we also think that um, when passive euthanasia is permissible, at least across a wide range of cases, it's because patients have consented to it either in the moment or just prior to the moment or at some point in the past when they said, oh, if I'm ever in such, th thus such a condition, go ahead and remove me from life support. So um, it seems like, according to Marquis and other theorists, that active euthanasia can be permissible for the very same reasons. It can be merciful to actively euthanize someone, and it could it could also be within um, respecting people's autonomous wishes as well. So, so think about like the paradigmatic cases of, of passive euthanasia involve removing someone from life support. Again, given certain conditions have been satisfied, very important conditions, no doubt. Um, active euthanasia, the paradigmatic case would be injecting someone with some kind of legal lethal substance, providing the palliative care, of course, because you want to be a case of euthanasia. Okay, so Mark was here, he's distancing himself, isn't he, from the sanctity of human life theorists, again. So um, he's going to want to say, look, DTWK is perfectly consistent with active euthanasia. This is a virtue of DTWK, okay, given that active euthanasia is, bro is broadly speaking, at least among philosophers, to be um, considered to be um, morally permissible. But keep in mind, uh, the, the species chauvinism, or the anti-species chauvinism that follows from DTWK is also supposed to be an advancement on, um, on thinking about the wrongness of killing compared to the sanctity of human life use. Think about what the theory, think about the name of the theory, the sanctity of human life. So it's humans that are sort of privileged. And on Marquis's view, there's a kind of speciesism or species chauvinism there that's in place that DTWK isn't, um, isn't hampered by. Okay, and moreover, DTWK does a nice job of explaining not only why um, it's wrong to kill, you know, toddlers, but also why it'd be wrong to kill, or why it's wrong to kill you and I. It's also explaining why it's wrong to kill toddlers and infants and the severely mentally disabled. And so DTWK um, can accommodate um, um, and account for the wrongness of killing um, even those who we might want to say are persons, full-fledged persons, as those who run pro-choice arguments. Um, would tend to do. Okay, so that's a lot of, of support for the, um, the premise of Marquis's argument that just establishes DTWK and then DTWK applies to you and I, that's the easy case, and then the next premise in the argument involves applying DTWK not just to you and I, but to, to fetuses. Why think that um, DTWK applies to fetuses? Well, it seems like they have futures like ours. They, they're going to have valuable futures just like ours. They just have to develop. They just have to continue developing, and and they will have futures just like ours. So DTWK applies to us. It applies to fetuses. There's your restrictivist argument. So now if you're going to challenge this this argument, if you're going to challenge um, uh, Marquis's argument, you can either challenge the um, DTWK claim, or you can challenge the claim that DTWK applies to fetuses. Now what I want to do in the remaining time in this video is talk about a challenge to the DTWK theory. Um, in the Marcos paper he does talk about some challenges to the second premise or the premise that involves applying DTWK to, uh, to fetuses. But the challenge to DTWK itself is a famous one that's um, that's worth saying some things about. It might be one of the more complicated things that comes up in the Marquis paper. So the uh, the objection to DTWK here is called uh, the contraception objection. And according to the contraception objection, um, um, because DTWK implies that contraception use is impermissible, then DTWK itself is false. Why? Because, of course, contraception is permissible. So DTWK implies something that um, is implausible namely the impermissibility of contraception use. So that's big picture, but the details are going to matter. So why think that, um, why think that DTWK is going to imply the wrongness of contraception use, the immorality of contraception use? Well, um, remember, 
according to DTWK, we've got this very you know, general and sufficient condition for the wrongness of killing. So it's it's wrong to kill me if if I'm deprived of a valuable future, the valuable future that I would have had were I not to have been killed. But um, what about what about cases where contraception use is effective, and um, there's then in those cases, isn't there, there are entities that would have come into existence were contraception not to have been used. Let me say that again. In cases of successful contraception use, where contraception is, is, is effective, right, there seems like there's some entity that would have been brought into existence were contraception not to have been used. And then the way the contra contraception objection is supposed to go here is that that entity, that entity that would have come into existence were contraception not to have been used, that entity is deprived of, guess what? A valuable future, the future that it would have had, okay, were it not, were it not the case that contraception, um, were the case that contraception were not used, excuse me. So um, there's your entity that would be a victim of deprivation. Um, and so it looks like then that DTWK is going to end up implying that um, it is uh, impermissible to use contraception because all things being equal. Uh, because again, some entity or other will be deprived of a valuable future. So DTWK doesn't apply just to you and I, it doesn't apply to fetuses, but it also applies to potential zygotes, it seems, right? Like those, be those beings that would have come into existence where contraception ought to have been used. So hopefully we're understanding the contraception objection. Big picture again, the way it goes is this. DTWK, it implies that contraception use is impermissible, but contraception use is permissible, so DTWK is false. Okay, and, and um, support for the claim that contraception use is permissible. It's just left intuitive. Um, Marquis certainly accepts it, so he thinks that there's got to be something wrong with the premise that has it that. DTWK implies that contraception use is impermissible in the first place. Okay, so we understand the contraception objection. Marquis's reply. Marquis says, okay, let's think very carefully about this. What entity exactly is deprived of a valuable future? And he says, let's just canvas the possibilities here. Perhaps it's the egg, the egg that would have been fertilized, right? Where contraception ought to have been used. This is the female egg that would have been fertilized where contraception ought to have been used. Well, Marco says that's arbitrary because why isn't it the male sperm? Why isn't it the male sperm that is the, um, the victim here of deprivation? So these first two options end in arbitrariness so we can rule them out suppose it's it's the two of them together it's the it's the egg in the female and it's the sperm in the male and it's the sort of the set but it's not the it's not the the fusion or the fertilization uh, yet it's just the, it's the two of them together then it's not arbitrary right Marx says okay, maybe it's not arbitrary but now you have too many things here that are victims of deprivation in most cases anyways we think that there's only one thing right at most that would be a victim of deprivation okay, in such cases, right? So not that Marcus thinks that there is any victim, as we're gonna to get to, but if there were a victim, there isn't, but if there were, there's only one, there's not two, okay? So then perhaps the most viable alternative is, is it's the fusion of the two. So it's not them taken separately, it's them taken together. It's the it's the egg and the sperm, right? And it's the the the, the egg and the egg that would have been fertilized by that specific sperm, okay, or something like that. And Marquis claims that there's no identifiable victim here. And so if there's no identifiable victim, then there's no victim. And so there's no, then, um, entity that is deprived of a valuable future. So we ran through four possibilities of, 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 of individuals or entities that would be victims of deprivation, and every single one of them fails. Now... The last thing I want to I want to note here, um, just here in conclusion, is that um, Marquis was taken to task by a philosopher named Alistair Norcross for making the inference that because there's no identifiable victim in cases of contra of successful contraception use, then there's no victim. So we can't move from we can't identify who the victim is, in whatever sense, whatever we mean by identifiable, um, to the claim that there is no victim. So we can't move from there's no identifiable identifiable victim to the claim that there is no victim. That's just a bad inference. And Marquis, he recognized it seeing that he um, he made a mistake here. 
and that he should have been um, a bit more careful. And so, um, as you can imagine, lots of people responded to Marquis, and so he had a series of re replies. Let me see if I can give you maybe maybe his best reply overall. Um, his reply is going to be this, um, I think giving him his absolute best here, which you may not want to do, but let's just do that anyways. And what Marcos wants to claim is, uh, look, um, we need to keep in mind that um, that it's true that in cases of successful contraception use, that there is some entity or other that is prevented from coming into existence, right? That's clear as day, right? I mean, contraception wouldn't be used if, if it weren't the case that sometimes it's effective and did prevent um, females from getting pregnant, from couple, did prevent couples from becoming pregnant, right? And so, so there is certainly, right, certainly the case that there's a prevention that goes on, right? But it doesn't follow from that that there's a deprivation. So not all preventions are deprivations. And so the person who runs a contraception objection is sort of conflating prevention with deprivation, and they shouldn't do that. So what Marquis wants to say is just because you have just because something's prevented from coming into existence doesn't mean that there's an entity there that is deprived of something. And Marquis has something very intuitive here, right? It's that look, there is actually nothing that comes into existence. So we prevent something from coming into existence. So there's nothing actually there, as it were, that could have the property of being deprived of a valuable future in the first place. This is important because it seems like only actual things, things that actually exist, can be deprived or be harmed or be wronged, right? So it's going to turn out that even though we have a prevention, we don't have a deprivation, right? And this is not just splitting hairs, making, right, creating a distinction where there is no difference because there does seem to be a difference between merely preventing something from happening and depriving um, some uh, something from, depriving um, someone of something. So, um, so I've used examples in this video series, haven't I? So, I mean, suppose there's a case where I prevent you from enjoying a cupcake that you'd really like to have. I mean, it's a small cupcake and it was given to just me. I prevent you from having it. I've deprived you of anything. It's my cupcake and it's small, it's tiny. As small as you need it to be, though. So just a bite size. Okay, so it's not like it's practical to even share it with you. Right, suppose, suppose you have your own, your own cupcake. Right? But now imagine a case where I'm given a cake to share with you, and I prevent you from having it. Yeah, in that case, I've deprived you of something, haven't I? So not all preventions are deprivations. Let's be captured by, by thinking about these cases. It's an, these are everyday distinctions. So all Marcus is doing is helping himself to what already exists in our ordinary thinking about deprivation on the one hand, prevention on the other. So. Perhaps there are responses to, to Mark was there, but we'll leave it there. Um, so this, that concludes my discussion of Marquis's classic 1989 essay, Why Abortion is Immoral. I went a little bit beyond it at the very end to talk about how Marquis responds to give him his best in response to the contraception objection. No doubt there are still philosophers out there who think that he did successfully reply to it, but there you have it, perhaps his best response. Thank you all for watching. If you have any questions, be sure to let me know, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.